Welcome to Mastering Your Financial Life, hosted by Judy Heft, the founder and CEO of Judith Heft & Associates Financial and Lifestyle Concierge. This year, they're celebrating 26 years in business. In every episode, Judy interviews professionals who help others successfully manage their financial lives. You can find this show on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. Judy is the author of two books, How to Be Smart, Successful, and Organized with Your Money, For a Better Today and Tomorrow, and her latest book, Mastering Your Financial Life Cycles, How to Successfully Manage Money in Every Decade of Life. You can read chapters of her books and catch prior episodes of this show at www.judithheft.com. Now here's the host of Mastering Your Financial Life, Judy Heft. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our 40th episode of Mastering Your Financial Life. And I am Judy Heff, Financial and Lifestyle Concierge, and we're celebrating. We're up to 27 years in business now. And today my guest uh, is Andrea Brody. Andrea is a partner at Abrams Festerman, and she's admitted both in D.C. and New York, which is really helpful. And she focuses mostly on matrimonial and family issues. And I just want to, you know, we're going to talk to Andrea and we're going to talk a little bit about preparing for a divorce. If you can prepare for it or planning in some way, it's not something you want to plan the day you get married, but it's, it, unfortunately it happens. So you need to be prepared. And we're going to talk to Andrea and she's going to help us uh, come up with some ideas and suggestions. So welcome, Andrea. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So I guess, you know, like, there are so many things that you need to know. I think people think, you know, there's this fantasy you fall madly in love and you get married and you live happily ever after. But unfortunately, that's not always the way it goes. So what do you think, you know, what are some of the things that you wish people knew before they were, you know, falling in love and getting married or maybe not falling in love, but getting married? You know, one of the things that I think I probably hear most from prospective clients when they're coming in for oftentimes a divorce consultation is they wish they had known what was necessary to preserve separate property. That could be money that you're coming into the marriage with, a gift from a family member, which we often see at times when people are buying their first home. A lot of times they're getting a gift from a, you know, a family member or a friend for a down payment, um, inheritance that's received during the marriage. And certain of those things are more easy to preserve as, as a separate property credit than others. And so I often wish people knew what the laws were, at least here in New York. And I imagine that they're probably fairly similar in other states. But since I primarily practice in New York, that that's my focal point. But there's very specific requirements to establish a separate property claim or credit. And a lot of that has to do with sufficient documentation. And as you said, I don't know of anyone who goes into a marriage thinking that they're potentially getting a divorce and fast forward 5, 10, 15 years, spouse finds themselves in a situation where they're considering it. And then they realize perhaps it's too late because there's not enough time to go back and produce the paper trail. Financial institutions are only required to maintain records for a certain amount of time. And I think most cases it's up to seven years. So if you're filing or considering a divorce 10, 15, 20 years later, and you don't have the financial records, it becomes difficult, if not almost entirely possible at times to establish separate property. And a lot of times we're talking about significant dollars and you're not t think talking about a couple hundred dollars. I mean, I've had some cases where it's in the hundreds of thousands, even in the millions that we're talking about. And so those documents really do matter. Absolutely. So but how do you plan for that, though? Because I know somebody that was in a 25 year marriage and then they ended up getting divorced and this person had inherited uh, some real estate property in New York City, investment property, income property. And because they had been married so long and it wasn't anything that was planned for, they had to split it half of it had to go to, you know, one partner and the other half to the other partner. When this person, you know, inherited all that from his parents on his own, but it came in after they were married for a while. So how do you anticipate those types of situations? So certainly if you're coming into the marriage and there's any question about a particular 
asset or money that you're coming into the marriage with, a prenuptial agreement is certainly one way to protect that money or that asset. But a lot of times people aren't thinking about a prenuptial agreement or even for, you know, emotional or psychological reasons decide that it's not the right um, vehicle for them. And that's and that's perfectly fine. So that's where having the documentation becomes that much more important and, and preserving the paper trail. So hypothetically, if you as a, you know, you're about to get married, you have an account savings account with ten thousand dollars in it. It's important to not only keep a copy of your statement as of right around the time that you're getting married, but then you have to also maintain all of the statements going forward to show that you're not adding any money into that account during the marriage, unless it's also otherwise considered separate property money. So if you were to receive inheritance and you put it into that account, as long as you keep the paper trail that shows exactly where the money came from and what money is being commingled together, you can hopefully preserve the separate property nature. Now for money that you're receiving during the marriage, the presumption in New York is that it is considered marital money, but there are certain um, caveats to that, or there are certain buckets of money, if you will, that would otherwise be considered separate property, such as inheritance or a gift from another family member. So in those instances, and assuming that you're not contemplating what we call a postnuptial agreement, which is similar to a prenuptial agreement, but you're entering into it during the marriage. So it would be an agreement where you're specifically defining or allocating a particular um, account or asset as presumably a separate property. But if you're not entering into that kind of an agreement, the best thing I can recommend is if it's money that you're receiving, open up a brand new account, deposit that money into that account, and do not put any other money in there. And again, going oh. forward, keep all of the statements so you can show I received, you know, ten thousand dollar inheritance check. Here's the, uh, you know, the probate documents for the estate where I got it. I kept it in this account. No other money came in, and no money came out. So in other words, you can't spend that money. You, just you, can't, you can't spend the money, but you won't necessarily be able to recoup what you've spent as a separate property credit. So hypothetically, you've received $10,000, you take 5000 of that to go on a lavish vacation. Then at the end of the day, you presumably have 5000 left in the account. If you're contemplating filing for divorce, what you're potentially asking is for a separate property credit of the 5000 and not the original ten. And then that's interesting. That's something I didn't know. And so then what about uh, why would someone enter into a postnup and how does that emotionally affect the relationship? Because I would think that if someone, you know, after you've been married for 10, 15, 20 years, and then you decide, you know, what, I, I want to get a postnup, I have this other money that I don't want anything to happen with, or maybe the marriage is getting a little rocky and you're concerned that you might not be able to salvage it. You know, how does that work? How does that factor into the relationship? You know, it's interesting because I actually had a client enter into a postnuptial agreement within the last year. She inherited real estate during the marriage and the family wanted to make sure that the property would be hers in the event of a divorce. She and her husband, it was a second marriage for both of them. And they not only identified that the property itself would be her separate property, but they very specifically delineated how the expenses for the property were going to be paid, which was its in this particular case, that the wife was going to be responsible for all of the expenses since it was her property. That's not necessarily what <clears throat> the law would dictate, but that really the purpose of a postnuptial agreement is oftentimes just to identify certain assets as separate property in the event of a divorce. Sometimes you also do that for estate planning purposes, mm -hmm. um, which at that point I would certainly recommend that you consult with you know, a trust and estates attorney to make sure that it jives on both ends. Um, sometimes post-nuptial agreements, people enter into them because just circumstances change when you have, you know, two people perhaps that are working at the time of the marriage, but are no longer working, whether it's because of children or um, illness. I've had some people enter into an agreement that addresses support based upon, you know, just change in circumstances. Like I said, whether it's illness or something else, or perhaps one one uh, spouse decides to stop working to take care of an elderly parent that needs help. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen in life and, and throughout a marriage. And so oftentimes a postnuptial agreement can help address some of those issues. In fact, I've actually had a lot of people who enter into a postnuptial agreement to modify what they put in a prenuptial agreement because oh, the prenuptial agreement 
no longer really works for the circumstances. Life changes. Yes, exactly. That's interesting. I didn't know about that either. So, you know, so, you know, I think, you know, you enter into the marriage, like we said before, you're, you know, you're hoping it's going to last forever and ever. Amen. And then, you know, things happen. And so if you're at that point where you're thinking, you know what, I think maybe I am contemplating a divorce. This marriage isn't working. I've tried everything, you know, it's going to be amicable. And the, so what are some of the things that people should be doing? If they're contemplating filing. I mean, first and foremost, I always recommend consult with, you know, a matrimonial attorney. And I even say consult with more than one attorney because attorneys, the nice, the law is the law, but attorneys have a different way of interpreting it. Mm -hmm. And depending upon the facts may have, you know, a creative way to address it that maybe another attorney doesn't. And I also think it's important to find somebody that you're comfortable with and that you jive with, you know, just on a personal level and personalities are different. So you want someone who you would otherwise um, just that you would get along with because it's not just about what you know, but it's also how it can be relayed and shared. And because part of my job is it's not just attorney law, but it's also counselor. So I'm sure I need to be able to speak the same language with my clients to make sure that mm -hmm. they're you know, hearing the advice that I have. But second to that, and assuming you've already met with an attorney, it's also really important to have the appropriate financial team in place. That's making sure that you have an accountant that you trust and a financial advisor, a financial planner that you trust. And a lot of financial planners out there also have a special certification called, you know, certified uh, divorce financial analyst. So they've had specialized training so that way they know specifically what the matrimonial attorney will be looking for, as well as the training to be a financial planner. So it really is kind of a nice, comprehensive um, financial team, if you will. Um, in many instances, I find that one of the spouses really has no idea what the finances are of the marriage. Oftentimes, accounts are only in one person's name. Um, and even if they're in joint name, for whatever reason, they don't have access to the financial statements. They really don't know what they're spending. And so from my perspective, when there's any financial issues, that's my very first starting point is I, I have clients prepare what's called a, a statement of net worth, you know, financial statement that sets forth their monthly expenses, the assets and the liabilities to really get a, a global picture of, you know, what's at stake here. And when you're the spouse that really doesn't have that information, it can be extremely overwhelming and daunting. So if you have the right people in place, then those people are going to help you identify what documents to look for and where you might be able to look for them. <clears throat> for instance, tax returns, you know, I, I'll ask the client to bring me the last five years of tax returns. It, it's astounding how many clients either don't have access to them, don't know where they're ma maintained in the home, and don't know that they can go online to the IRS and fill out a form and request copies of the tax returns. It takes a little bit of time, but you don't have to rely on your spouse to necessarily produce those documents. And certainly with a financial planner, between a financial planner and the attorney can help gather as much information as possible, because I think that's really the strongest foundation for deciding whether A, you want to proceed with the divorce and be feeling comfortable to do it because without the information, I think it's just, it's extremely overwhelming. Absolutely. We're going to take a little break here now, and then we're going to come back and talk more. This is an interesting topic and I want to dig a little deeper into it. So I'm here with Andrea Brody. This is Judy Heft and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Hey there. I just want to tell you a little bit about my new book that just came out called Mastering Your Financial Life Cycles. And here it is. It's how to successfully manage your money in every decade of life. I co-authored this with my CFO, Liz Levy. And together we created this manual that's going to help you through every stage of life. We talk about having a baby. We talk about young adulthood, pre-retirement, what to do when you're at that age of retirement, if you're contemplating divorce, do you need an estate plan? We cover all of these, each subject in a different chapter. And I really think that you're going to find this so helpful because at the end of every chapter, we have checklists that you can look at and you can use and they can be a guide for you. So this is a wonderful manual that we've created. It's available on Amazon. You can also find it on our website at judithhep.com book. 
And we're here for you. If you need anything, reach out. I hope you enjoy the book. Here's another picture of it, just so you know what's going on. Here it is. And I'm really proud of it. It's my second book. And I'd love to have you uh, read it and give me your feedback. Judy Heft, judithheft.com, financial and lifestyle concierge, celebrating 26 years in business. And over the years, I've learned so much. And what I've been trying to do is impart a little bit of this knowledge to you so I can help all of you become as financially organized as I am. Hi, everybody. And we're back. We're back here with Andrea Brody. Uh, Andrea is a matrimonial and family attorney. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we were just talking about getting all your documents together, knowing what numbers you need. Well, you know, a lot of times, you know, the, Andrea, that was something that really uh, I could relate to because we see a lot of um, non-moneyed spouses. And sometimes it's the moneyed spouse, too, that are contemplating divorce. And we work closely with them. We've done a lot of financial affidavit statement and net worth because, like you said, they don't have access. They don't know what their user IDs and passwords are. You know, the non-moneyed spouse oftentimes leads to the money spouse leads everything leads you know they just kind of give up their power it's so funny because being in the financial world i gave up my power you know i didn't know anything i was just like you know i was like 30 years ago i've been divorced 30 years but it was a different person then and i didn't understand all the intricacies of finances and i was just happy to just turn everything over and that didn't work either because he was also the not money spouse so it was back and forth and, you know, we were playing games like he did it for paid all the bills and handled the finances for six months. And then I would take over and it just wasn't working. It was part of the, the marriage problem too. the, you know, the money issues, which often are. But, uh, you know, it's fascinating to me that these people really have no clue what they're spending their money on. And I think most people come to us like that. It's interesting. And that's why, you know, we love to help them figure all that out. It's a little bit of digging deep. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, look, certain cases are much more challenging than others, but I think with the right team of people can certainly uncover the information and <clears throat> just may take a little bit of time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that a lot of people don't know what you said, too, is they can go right on the IRS website and order their uh, tax returns and get copies of them, you know, but. It's, you know, I feel like right now I've become over the years, I've learned so much from all the different people that I've met, you know, not only the professionals, but even the clients learning from their mistakes too, that, you know, finally took me a while, maybe, you know, the last 10 years, my finances finally got nice and organized and where I like them, where I have a good handle on them. And I think that's so important. I wish I had known all of this stuff before my divorce, but you know, what's hindsight's 2020. Is that what they say? Yes, always. <laughs> but, you know, hopefully I'm helping other people and, you know, that's all I can do. So what are some of the other kinds of issues? And, and also, like, what are some of the clients that you represent? Do you do litigation, um, collaborative or mediation, or do you do all three? You know, what is your specialty so, area? I'm pretty much litigation exclusive, but, you know, people hear that and think, oh, so every case goes to court. And the answer is no, most cases don't go to court and most cases do settle. Um, but I don't have the certification or the training for mediation and I don't do collaborative law, but I do work with other attorneys in my firm that do those things. So my firm has the ability to service for mediation or collaborative, but mm -hmm. I, I don't personally. Um, so litigation in, in my world can mean a lot of different things. And as I said, most cases do settle. So I have the ability to negotiate a settlement agreement. Sometimes it's in the middle of proceedings that are in court. And many times, as I said, two people never set foot in a courthouse and they, and they don't need to to resolve their issues. It depends upon the complexity of the issues and how reasonable two people want to be. Um, but in addition to, you know, separate property issues and division of assets, oftentimes support is a big component of what I do, whether that's spousal support for one spouse or child support for the children and what that considers. And if you're paying spousal support, then that reduces income available for child support. And so, um, you know, we look at all of the different expenses and where in theory they're supposed to be allocated. And, you know, part of what we do is also doing income analysis and, and lifestyle analysis, because as you'll find if you have a spouse or if you are the spouse that has an ownership interest in a business and isn't a W-2 employee, it becomes a little more 
challenging to establish what the actual income is. And there are companies out there that will do um, forensic evaluations to determine not only the value of an ownership interest, but then from that reasonable compensation, because sometimes a portion of the, what you see on a tax return really falls under the bucket of value of the business, which is an equitable distribution issue because it's an asset versus income, which is what we're using to establish support, whether that's spousal support and or child support. So I guess the more complicated it is, you know, the more, the longer it's going to take and the more you need a lawyer, a good lawyer that can represent you. And that's so interesting what you said about litigation doesn't always go to court. I guess I had that idea in my head that if you're a litigator, then you go to court. And I, I hope our listeners learned from that one too, because I didn't realize that because we think of litigation as, you know, arguing in court. Most of the time when my, when divorce cases end up in court, at least initially, it's because you have an opposing spouse who isn't cooperating with the process, maybe hasn't formally responded to indicate that they're um, going to proceed. So when you're starting an action for divorce, you, you file a pleading, it's a summons and complaint, and usually the formal response is called an answer. And so if they don't serve you with an answer, then at depending upon the other communications around that, it may be perceived as not proceeding. And so sometimes people will then file to have a judge appointed because they want to get the process moving along a bit faster. Another reason you might end up in court is if there are more urgent issues that have to be addressed that can't be resolved. So for instance, the moneyed spouse isn't paying support to the non-moneyed spouse and the non-moneyed spouse truly needs money for expenses or you know, in really unfortunate circumstances, if there are issues of domestic violence that need to be addressed or services are about to be shut off at the house due to non-payment. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why people could end up in court. And sometimes it's even custody related and parenting time. And so if there's emergent issues that need to be addressed, then that's often how people end up in court. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that once you're in court, you're in court unless either you're choosing to uh, reconcile or you settle the case or it gets decided after trial. So it's sort of like once you ring that bell, you can't unring it. Once a judge is appointed, a judge is going to see you through to the conclusion, whether that's because the two of you can figure it out or the judge has to make a decision after a full trial. Oh, that's really good information. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So, Andrea, this was so great talking to you. I think that you have a wealth of uh, knowledge there that we were able to share with our listeners, and I'm sure that they got a lot out of it. I know I did. I learned some new things. So, thank you. But do you thank want you to so just much for having me? Oh, my pleasure. And how can they find you? Um, well, certainly on my website, um, which is www.abramslaw.com. And if you search under the attorney tab and put in my name, all of my profile and all of my contact information will come up. And then what about LinkedIn? Can they find you on LinkedIn? Yes, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Absolutely. Great. Good. All right. Well, thank you so much, Andrea. It was a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure as well. You've been listening to Mastering Your Financial Life, hosted by Judy Heft. Thank you for your positive reviews, comments, and sharing this show with others. You can read chapters of Judy's books and catch prior episodes of Mastering Your Financial Life at www.judithheft.com.